twinkled stars in heaven could do anything that he pleased. He who formed the highest mountains is the God of all that was and is to be. Yet he chose to make his son a helpless baby to become a willing sacrifice. His love unfolded right before our eyes. All along he knew that Jesus had to die. He's a God of all gods, King of all kings. He's the great and mighty maker of all things. Yet this God of all gods and Lord of all lords chose to give his son for you and me. What a great God. and compassion only as a father's heart could be the Lord could see our desperation yet we never even knew we had the need though he's the ruler of all ages he bestowed the gift of his own blood. Who could comprehend the Lord of all would pay this price, this offering of love? He's a God of all gods, King of all kings. He's the great and mighty maker of all things. Yet this God of all gods and Lord of all lords chose to give his son for you and me. today for what's going to happen right here in our local church. You know, as I look ahead on the calendar, I see our men and boys camp out, the staff advanced training time. Uh, I look beyond that to the very first Sunday of October, and we're going to have our Declare the Gospel Spiritual Leadership Conference. I trust that many of you are signing up for that and excited to be a part of what God is going to do. But I want to encourage you that as we enter into this season of ministry, that you'll be prayed up and ready to go. Let's ask God to work through our lives in a special way in 2021. I'm excited about pulling through this COVID season uh, once and for all and seeing some great fruit during the fall season. This morning, our speaker is Brother Jim Shetler. Brother Shetler is no stranger to us. We're so thankful that he's a part of our leadership team here at Lancaster Baptist and West Coast Baptist College. Brother Shetler not only teaches in the college and preaches across the country on a regular basis, but he also directs the Joshua Camps Ministry, which is a very fruitful outreach, training young people in a variety of topics, including a Christian worldview and preaching, to name a few. 
We love Brother Shetler. I know he's going to be a blessing to us today. Let's open our Bibles and receive the message gladly. Amen. I miss him. Don't you miss him? I miss my pastor. Amen. Amen. Well, if I call you campers today, I have preached 87 times in the last 35 days, and most of them have been to campers. So take it as a compliment. You look young today. Uh, so if I call you a camper, don't feel bad about that uh, as all. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Let me tell you something. Your pastor loves you, and he's out there. He does need the rest. But I'm telling you, I, I am sure not one of us in this auditorium have vacations like Pastor has. They're not really vacations, are they, for him? I mean, he is getting focused. He is getting, by the way, he seemed pretty pumped in that video that he probably made in April or something. But, uh, uh, it, but he seemed pretty pumped. Wait till he gets back. I was sitting in that chair. Uh, and I prayed for my pastor. I said, boy, next Sunday, he'll be sitting in that chair, Lord willing. And I just pray that God just will be on him. And we just thank you. We just thank the Lord so much uh, for pastor, his vision, his excitement. And uh, I know that he is absolutely uh, ready to get back, I am sure. And uh, it's exciting. I mean, we're the the direction we're kind of headed, our under shepherd has been seeking the Lord about, and it's going to be really, really good. So I'm, I'm excited. Now, I won't be here next Sunday, but uh, I'll probably feel his electricity all the way across the country. First Corinthians chapter number two. So one thing I have really stood out to me in the last five, six weeks of preaching is that there are absolutely, spiritually speaking, three types of people on this planet. And I've been preaching to these three types, but one of these three has, I, I don't have any facts or statistics, but I believe probably over two thirds fits in this one category. And, it, and it's concerning to me. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to begin reading at verse number 9, and we're going to go to chapter 3, verse 3. And I want you to see the three types of people. We are going to look at the spiritual man, we will see the natural man, and then we will see the carnal man. And um, I want to talk to you today about the carnal man. I believe that two-thirds of the teenagers, and probably greater, that I spoke to know Christ as their Savior. But they were our carnal believers, and I believe that we saw some amazing things in the last five, six weeks of camps. Uh, I do want to make one comment and one testimony and one praise to God. We did have something happen this past week. Our camp was hijacked this past week. And it was really so. I never experienced it before like this, but our camp was hijacked. It was hijacked by the Holy Spirit. And, and I want to tell you something. I never taught, never preached, and never been a part of a camp that had more external opposition as we had this week. More things happen externally than I've ever been involved with any camp. And... Um, it wasn't with campers. It was just things that happened externally and just so many things. And yet, in every one of those things, it was so obvious it was the Holy Spirit's camp and not our camp. Um, you know, Pastor just said on the video, and Brother Shuttler directs Joshua camps. Brother Shuttler did not direct Joshua camps this past week. The Holy Spirit did. And I, you know what? I'll even give you a, a humorous, cool, spiritual um, illustration of that. Thursday night, we had a bonfire for all the seniors and recent graduates. We made that clear. We said very specifically because there were just so many. One thing that Joshua Camps does, it attracts a much older teenager. Most of the teenagers, or most of the camps I speak at, your average age is probably 14 or 15, not at Joshua Camps. I'd say the average age is more 16, close to 70, average age 
We don't have a lot of junior hires come to Joshua Camps. It's usually older ones. I, I, I think that's really special. But because of that and the pizza and everything, we couldn't do it. We just had too many juniors, seniors, and recent grads. So we just did the, uh, the first week we were able to do it, and we did it over at Pastor's house. And by the way, how cool is that? Pastor's not even there, and we're in his backyard. I, I'm not sure he knew that, but no, 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 he did <laughs> And you know what? I really got a great text from Pastor and Terry, and they said, absolutely, use our backyard. Hey, by the way, doesn't that say something about your pastor? How, how, how would you like to have over 100 teenagers come to your backyard and you not be there, okay? And we really, we played hide and seek in the house. And no, we didn't. <laughs> Pastor, we didn't. I don't know if he's watching. <laughs> no, we didn't. We just stayed in the backyard. But I, I really will tell you, that was really special. But there was just so many this, this past week. So we said seniors and uh, recent grads. Well, I got to tell you, that was a bonfire like I'd never experienced before. Um, those were some of the most transparent testimonies about life-changing decisions, very personal, extremely personal things that the young people said, hey, this week I got this taken care of in my life. This week I was this and now I am this. And I, I don't even feel at liberty to tell you what those were, even though that they made public testimonies of it. It was unbelievable. I, I've never seen anything like that. But just to tell you how the Holy Spirit hijacked, the very last testimony, God gets up. He said, hey, I'm going into my junior year, and I know I'm not supposed to be here tonight. <laughs> but he said, I think God brought me to this camp this week to hear these testimonies. And he said, God spoke to my heart tonight, and I made a decision about living for God because of the testimonies. And I thought... And I'm sitting there, hey, you're, you're not supposed to be here. And the Holy Spirit, like, hey, Jim, I got this thing, okay? I got, and it was like that all week long. It was just things like that. It's just like, you know what? This is not my camp. This is God's. And God hijacked it. And I, I will just tell you, uh, the Holy Spirit just gave such a freedom. Uh, Brother Gibbs spoke Monday and Tuesday. And he said to me um, in the car, as he, as, as he was leaving the service on uh, Tuesday night, he said, Brother Shetler, there's just something special about this camp. And I just said, you know what? And that special is the Lord and the Holy Spirit. All of you that prayed, all of you that were a part of it, I, I gotta tell you, um, God just really spoke and it was really special. But I'm also gonna share uh, today that uh, there's just a lot of carnality out there. And I see it in my own life. And I even, you know, just said, you know, God, I'm preaching this today. I'm not sure. Am I the spiritual man or the carnal man? And I think we all really need to evaluate where we are. And some of us may be the natural man in here. We're going to look at that. We're going to ask God to bless and we're going to study this uh, passage and we're going to look at a few others. We're going to look at the cause for the carnal believer, the characteristics of the carnal believer, and the cure for the carnal believer. And just in the last 48 hours, the Lord just really put this on my heart. And I, and I just sense, you know, Lord, um, we need revival. We need what happened. A lot of carnal believers came to Joshua camps and left spiritual believers. And that's my desire for today as well. There were young people that came natural man came unsaved and left saved. And we're thankful for all of these decisions. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on, on his word. Father, may 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, may Galatians chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, and Romans 8 be touched by you this morning. I pray, Father, boy, we, we, we've heard some great preachers. Lord, I've only been here for two of the Sundays but Lord, you have filled this pulpit with great truth. Lord, I do pray for a spirit of conviction. I thank you for our church, the Lancaster Baptist. I take a moment, I pray for our under shepherd. 
Lord, I pray that there would be a refreshing, a renewal, a revival, a refocusing, whatever pastor has needed, I pray that you will have fulfilled. May the, may, may the word of God, and you know, Lord, I know he reads a lot of books, and those will be good, but Lord, may his time in the word be the most precious to him. And Lord, I ask that you'll give him guidance, direction. May him and Terry come back as one. Um, I just pray, Lord, that you just be with our pastor. And may there be enjoyment. May there be laughter in our pastor's life this week. May there be just a a spirit of joy. So we lift up our pastor. We pray you'd be with him, protect him physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And I thank you, Lord, for this day and this opportunity now to preach. Convict our hearts today, Lord. May we evaluate where we are spiritually. May we be willing to take care of it. Father, we don't have to crucify ourselves. Christ already did. We just got to believe where we are. And we just need to, uh, to, to just take part in that funeral and just realize that we are dead. And uh, Lord, may we uh, live our lives as we are dead to the flesh. And uh, uh, Lord, uh, may we see from our position that there is a practice that needs to come from that position. And so I pray that we will understand that today. And then Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, if there's a natural man here today, a, a man or a woman, a young person who does not have a relationship, Father, understood they would look at this as foolishness until the Holy Spirit would prick their heart. And so, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would do that today. And that, Lord, if there's somebody here that knows not Christ, I think about the next service, but, Lord, this service too. If there's someone that does not know Christ, God, may they leave here with the joy of the Lord, forgiveness of sins, and a relationship with their creator. And now they're their child. They have been born again. They have been born from above They are now born of God. Obviously, we all have physical parents. God, may there be someone today that would understood, I understand I need to be born of God and have a spiritual birth. So Lord, I pray that that would happen as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. amen. Look with me, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. We're going to begin reading at verse 9. I've heard a lot of preachers quote verse 9. Problem is, they don't quote verse 10. It says here, and I'm going to put my really cool, spiffy Dollar Tree glasses on here. (laughs) But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And I've heard many times preachers use this and they they say, yeah, you know, there's just a lot of things we're never going to understand and there's just a lot of things from infinite, you know, from from finite to infinite that we're going to miss and our ways are not God's ways and our thoughts are not God's thoughts and obviously there's so many things we do not know. Well, I would agree with that, but this isn't the passage that proves that. Because there are many areas, truths, observations that we are supposed to know. You say, well, you know, bless God, we're never going to know the answer to that. Look at the next verse. Yeah, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath um, has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But then look at the next verse. But God hath hath revealed them unto everyone together. What's the next word? Us. By his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Jump down to verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Hey, the spiritual man knows a lot. The spiritual man can judge a lot. The spiritual man can discern a lot. Boy, do we need discernment today. 
But we don't need discernment of a worldly sort. We need God's ability to separate an issue between truth and error. It is amazing to me what these young people are believing in their hearts. So many lies. They need discernment. Boy, I, I'm thankful for a worldview camp that gave them truth. Hey, this is the way you're supposed to think about this topic. This is the way you're supposed to separate this time. And we can know those things. Now look what it says, because we get introduced now. Really, we've already been introduced now. This is the spiritual man. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. This is definitely referring to the spiritual man. But now we come to the actual the first name here. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Okay, so we come across this first man, and this is the natural man. This is the majority of the billions of people on this planet. These are people that have been created by God in God's image. So they're not like other animals. They're not like anything else that's ever been created. But I'll tell you what they do not have. They do not have a spiritual relationship with the God who created them. They have a conscience. Oh, they have a conscience. They don't live off of instinct. They may be atheists and evolutionists. They may be your neighbors. They may be your relatives. But they have never come into a relationship with God. They are a natural man. Many of them are kind. Many of them are generous. Many of them are intellectual. Many of them are rich. Many of them are poor. Many of them are healthy. Many of them are sick. But there is one common denominator that the natural man all has. He does not have a relationship with God. He may have religion. Oh, he may have religion, but he doesn't have a relationship with God. He does not know where he would spend eternity. There is great doubt in his life, and he or she are trying to live out a life on this earth. They are natural man. I, uh, years ago, when I was pastoring a family in our church, Doug and Teresa, Teresa came to me and said, Pastor, we've got to start praying. My mother's coming to live with us for four to five weeks over a month. My mother's not saved. She's a very religious woman. Her whole life has been be good, do good, look good. She's hoping that her works are gonna get her saved. She is a very religious woman and been a part of a very religious church for all of her life. She's coming to live with us for over a month. Her name is Mary and she is absolutely Italian. And I, I, and, um, and I said, you know what? I'm excited about her. Bring her to my newcomers class. So I was teaching this newcomers class. It goes about 12 weeks. So she'll be in there for at least four or five of those weeks. And, uh, and, and let her sit in and listen to those lessons. Well, sure enough, Mary came. And I liked Mary right to begin with. And Mary liked me. Matter of fact, after the second week, she said, you know, you're the, my favorite priest I've ever heard speak. <laughs> And you know what? I thought, amen. I believe in the priesthood of the believer. Amen. I'm good. And, uh, and I said, well, that's great. I, I'm glad that I'm your favorite priest. You know, and she came every week. And they would talk back at home. And uh, I don't remember what week it was. I think it was about the third week she was there. We got to talking after Sunday school. And I found out that not only is she Italian, but she cooks Italian. Well, now I become the natural man here. Okay. <laughs> But I go like, you know what? I, I got to tell you, I, I think Italian food may be my, be my favorite, Mary. She said, and she says, well, you haven't tasted Italian food until you've tasted mine. And I said, okay, I believe you. When am I going to get to taste yours? And we started talking about different things. She said, well, I'll tell you what I make the best. I make the best matacati you've ever heard. When I said, matacati is one of my all-time favorite Italian dishes. I said, let's get this together. 
So sure enough, Teresa and Doug worked out a night. I, I think for some reason, I just remembered this. I think it was a Tuesday night. And Mary went out. She bought all the food herself. She started the night before. She worked all day on putting together this Italian meal. Teresa called me up a couple times during the day. She said, Pastor, she just ain't going to believe it. I have never seen my mother so focused on a meal in my entire life. I said, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> now, I told nobody what I was going to do. And I definitely didn't tell my wife and my boys because I know my wife, no, you cannot. And I, but I knew, I said, Lord, I'm taking a shot at this. So we go over to Mary, and we go over to Doug and Teresa's house. And, uh, and, and, and Mary, we walked in and I thought like, Olive Garden, get out of here. This is, uh, this is the best smell I've ever had in my entire life. This is unbelievable. We sat down. She brought this Italian sausage that she had handmade. She had this bread. She had the salad. She had one thing. I mean, it was the, the best Italian meal I had ever had in my life. And she must have had four different dishes, you know, all kinds of things. It was just amazing. End of the meal. So she's sitting right here. I'm sitting at the head of the table, merely sitting right next to me, two, two chairs at the head, and Mary was right here. And Mary was a kind of a heavy set woman. And uh, okay, she probably ate her own cooking, is the deal. But anyways, at the end of the meal, I said to Mary, I said, Mary, I believe that is the best Italian meal I have ever eaten in my life. And I reached in my pocket and I brought out a little envelope that said for Mary on it. And I took the envelope and I began to slide it over to her. Well, everybody stopped talking at the table. Mary Lee is kicking me. <laughs> what are you doing? And I take this envelope and I push it over to her. And I said, this is a little something for you for the meal. Deathly quiet at the table, Mary looks at me and says, what's in that envelope? And I said, it's just a little money to give me. Teresa's at the other end. She goes, what are you doing? <laughs> Lee is going, what are you doing? I said, it's just a little money for you. I'm sure it doesn't cover the whole meal, but I just wanted to give you a little something. What happens next is unbelievable. Mary, Mary looks at the envelope. She pushes away from the table. She gets up and she looks at me and she says, what do you think? Do you think I did all of this for your little money? I did this because I care for you and I wanted to do this because I love you. And you know, she said all these nice things. She said, I didn't do this for some money. I am absolutely a And Teresa and Doug are going, oh, what have we done? My wife's like, that's it. Way to go, Jim. And I said to Mary, I said, Mary, I didn't think you were gonna take the money. But Mary, can you understand something? Jesus Christ died on the cross. He paid the price because he loves you. When you think that you can do something to get your way to heaven, Mary, you offend God. Do you honestly think, Mary, that you going to church is going to make God like, okay, thanks for doing a little something, even though my son died on the cross. Mary, why did Christ suffer and die on the cross if there's something you can do? And I am telling you, we, you could have heard a pin drop. Everyone's just like, <sighs> Mary is standing looking at me, and she says, you're telling me that it's not by what I do? And I said, that's right, Mary. 
And if it was by what you do, then God doesn't get the glory. Mary, this is the greatest Italian meal that I've ever had in my entire life. I don't want to ruin it by paying for it. Can I tell you what Jesus did for you on the cross is the greatest thing in the world? Don't ruin it by trying to live for it. Jesus paid for it. Mary did not get saved that night. Mary ends up getting saved on her deathbed in Colorado in a nursing home. And I got to see her a week before she passed away. And she got saved. Let me tell you, she remembered back to that meal. And she never forgot that truth. Now, let me just hear this. The natural man, the person who's here, who doesn't know the Lord, looks at what happens, hears the message, and says, that's stupid. That's foolishness. You guys have this faith that God came to this earth, lived this perfect life, and died on the cross, and you don't have to do anything. You just have to trust in what he did. Let me tell you something. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. If you're here today and you're a believer, you're saved, you know exactly the illustration I just gave. You understand completely it is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You understand, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the natural man does not understand that. The natural man is spiritually dead to spiritual things. And unless the Holy Spirit touches their heart, that day the Holy Spirit began to reveal salvation to Mary. And it was a process. It took a while. She didn't get saved that night. Sometimes people do. The Holy Spirit speaks or whatever. But just know this. If you're a natural man in here, you cannot, I don't know why these people go to this church. Why do you give so much? Why do you do this? If you're, if you're not saved, you have no concept. You're a natural man and you need God to do a work in your life. And then look at the next verse because there's another person here. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So the second person in this passage of scripture is the spiritual man. And the spiritual man is able to look at a situation and take it apart and say, this is God's way, this is man's way. Brother Shetler, I thought we as Christians, we shouldn't judge. All right, let's stop for a moment. Isn't there something in the Sermon on the Mount that when Jesus is preaching, he says, judge not lest ye be judged? Yes, chapter seven, verse one. But you need to read the other verses because in the context, this is what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. Hey, 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 hey. Don't be judging other people's lives if you got a beam in your own eye. But get the beam out of your eye and read the next verses. Then go and tell and help your brother correct what they need to correct. The Bible doesn't say we shouldn't judge. The Bible just said, ye which are spiritual judges all things. We're supposed to be able to discern things. But most people today, well, I don't know. I don't feel this. And well, that's the reason they're judging through their feelings. They're carnal. They're like babes. But I'm telling you, the spiritual man is able to judge. Now, there is one thing that we cannot judge. I can look at a teenager, and I have seen a lot of teenagers in the last six weeks, let me tell you. I can look at a teenager and know that they're struggling. I can look at a teenager and say, that's worldly. I can look, you say, Brother Sean, you're very judgmental. No, wait, 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 wait. I can't help that young person until I've made some decisions about them. But listen to this. I cannot judge why they are where they're at. 
but I can judge where they're at. I can look at a young person and go like, oh man, you are struggling, man. You are just really, bitterness is dripping from your face. Unforgiveness is in every word that comes out of your mouth. Now, I don't know why. I don't know what's happened to you. I don't know why you're unforgiving. I don't know why you have an unresolved violation of your justice system. I don't know why you're bitter. I can't judge that. I don't know why you're living the way that you're living. That's not up to me to judge. But I can absolutely judge. You ain't living right, man. And we that are spiritual are supposed to judge things. We're supposed to discern. We're supposed to be able to take something and say, hey, this is God's way and this is man's way. I gotta tell you something. We have a pastor that does that very well. Now I will tell you, pastor, you can't judge why they do what they do, but you can judge what they're doing. I can too. Matter of fact, we're supposed to. There's a spiritual man in this passage. There's a natural man in this passage. But I want you to see this. Because this is my message. There's a carnal man. And I, brethren, look at chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as on the spiritual. I can't speak to you as spiritual. But as on the carnal, even as on the babes in Christ, now, I know that Lancaster Baptist Church is not a normal church. Or actually, it is a normal church. We've got so many abnormal churches today. And I do know that there's a maturity level in this church that's good. But some of that you call maturity is just because you know a lot of things. And I want to tell you, six weeks I've been preaching to young people that at the beginning you've got to treat them like babes. Because there's just, they are so carnal. They come into those camps. Now we see, if we've seen amazing things happen. By the way, we did 32 sessions. 32 sessions in Worldview Camp. I, I, I'm different topic. And you think, no teenager's gonna be going to all those. Teenagers loved it. They wanted more. I think we've put the bar down so low. I think we need, and all of us, we always got to have everything. Now, what are we doing for entertainment? And what kind of coffee and what kind of donuts are we going to have? Okay, I'm not against coffee and donuts. I'm not against, I'm not against enjoyable things. But you know something? We have become so carnal. And it's just all about our flesh. And uh, okay, well, I I'll come, but is there, is there any, you know, is there any entertainment? Is there any of this? What, what are we going to do for free time? What's going to be the fun part of this? And I want to tell you. We've got to understand that the most important part of our being is the spiritual part of our lives in our being. But anyways, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now we get a few characteristics here. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. Okay, one of the absolute characteristics of a carnal believer is that they can't eat meat. They cannot handle it. They choke on it. They've got to, they've got to have stuff being funny, emotional, pulling at the heartstrings all the time. They got to have milk. They can't be just given truth. Look at verse three. For ye are yet, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now that last phrase is the key to our definition. What is a carnal believer, Brother Shetler? Somebody who's walking like a natural man, but has the spirit of God. So here's my definition. A child of God living like a natural man. A child of God living like a natural man. Self reigns. He has self-pity, he has self-promotion, and he's all about self-pleasure. He is a child of the King of Kings. He is on his way to heaven, but he lives like a natural man. Can I tell you, there is no one on this planet that is more unhappy than a carnal believer. 
A carnal believer is the most unhappy person on planet Earth. It's not. It's not an unsaved person. Because right now, the natural man, they think what we do is foolish. They're out having a good time. They're eating, drinking, and being merry. They're enjoying the pleasures of their sin. Many of them have not received the consequences yet for their sin. And there's a lot of natural man out there that are living it up. I'll tell you the most unhappy person on planet Earth, carnal believers. Because you are not living the victorious Christian life, but the world isn't doing it for you anymore. But you're still trying to promote yourself. You're still filtering everything through this self-life. And that is the most unhappy person. For 40 years, Two million Jews are saved out of bondage, but are not in the promised land. For 40 years, you have two million carnal Israelites that are between Egypt and the victorious life. And they're wandering. And while they're wandering, God doesn't let their shoes wear down. While they're wandering, their clothes never wear down. While they're wandering, they're eating the best food the world has ever known, manna. What's your point there, Brother Shetler? God was still taking care of these carnal people. And I think this is what confuses us. That many of us are living a carnal life, but we can say, well, you know, God's done this for me. And listen, you can be out of the will of God and you will never be out of the care of God. And some of us are living a carnal life. And we are so far from God, and yet God is providing for us. We even see answers to prayers once in a while. They did in the wilderness. And Paul writes to the church at Corinth and says, Hey, I can't even talk to you the way I should be able to talk to you. Because you're like babes. You get, you get so offended so easy. You pick up under people's offense. You're all divided into your little cliques and your little groups. You, you, you strive between each other. There's anger going on. Your marriages have so much bitterness in it. I can't even talk to you as spiritual. Oh, you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. But you're a carnal believer. And let's face it, it's a miserable life. And I got to tell you, I'm sitting up here and I'm putting this together. And I'm going, oh, Lord, I struggle with this. Man, how easy I get into the flesh. The cause for carnal believers. I want to tell you what the cause is. We are still living about self. We are living like a natural man, but we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. The characteristics of a carnal believer, we kind of already gone through them. You're not able to handle meat. You strive, you, you envy, you have interpersonal relationships problems. And I'll tell you, There's either unrighteousness or self-righteousness in your life. You are either doing things that are violating the commandments of God, or you think you're being righteous in what you're doing, and you kind of like, well, I've been saved for a long time, Brother Shetler. What does that mean? By the way, we never get to a point in our spiritual lives that we have attained a level that we cannot fall from. Okay, now I have reached this level. And now, no, no. This past week, God worked in my heart. Oh, man. Eric Getch was a messenger that God gave for my life. Guy's younger than me, a lot younger than me, but I'm telling you what God used his messages in my life. I'm on my knees after David Gibbs. I'm going, forget the campers. Man, I got to do, and I'm going to tell you this. You are never going to grow spiritually. As soon as you stop making decisions for God and you think you've arrived, that's it. You're done spiritually. And you're going to become carnal. we got to keep letting God speak to our heart. The characteristics of a carnal believer. Look, if you would, we're in 1 Corinthians. Real quick, go to Romans chapter 8. This is an incredible passage. While you're turning, there is a, uh, there's a verse in Galatians I wanted to uh, quote to you. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says this. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. There is a constant warfare going on 
between a believer's flesh, his self, his old man, and the new and the spirit. And that's what I'm saying. You, you're living it. If you're if you're being dominated by the by by carnality, and, and, and you're and you're living for yourself, and your whole schedule is about yourself and temporal things, and you're, you don't have an eternal perspective, you're struggling. You're the most unhappy person there is. Romans chapter 8, look at verse, um, I love verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, he never became sinful flesh. He did become, he did become a, a person, a human. But he never had that sinful desires like we did from Adam. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. That is the coolest thing. How can the righteousness, what, it, it's Jesus who lived right. I know, but we identify with him through the Holy Spirit. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind, entertain, have affections for, do mind the things of the flesh. What did you entertain this week? What did you have affections for this week? What was your mind all about this week? It'll tell you whether you're carnal or spiritual. But they that are of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, separation from God. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow, we got to get out of this carnal. And this is written to believers. Because the carnal mind, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. You get that flesh and you get the spirit, there is always a battle. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So, then they that are in the flesh well, cannot please God. If you are living for yourself, if you are living a natural man life, you are not pleasing God. But ye are not in the flesh, believer, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Brother Scheller, I know the Spirit of God dwells in me. Okay, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now look at verse 12 and 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. I just sold a house. And we paid off the mortgage. And we are not, we don't owe that bank a penny. It's been paid off. I am not a debtor to anyone right now in my life. We own our cars. We own, a, we don't have any, I am not a debtor to anything on this earth right now financially. So listen to me. You are not a debtor to the flesh. This week, you owe nothing to your flesh. This week, there is nothing. Well, here's the flesh calling again. No, and you don't pick the phone up. You don't answer. You say, I am dead. I've had a funeral. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You don't have to do all these things and perform. You just got to believe what you are and start living what you believe. You just, you know what? No, I don't owe my flesh anything and I don't have to do what my flesh wants me to do. I have overcome the flesh by what Christ did on the cross. It isn't a performance Christianity, but I'm telling you this, every position I have ever had in my life has had responsibility with it. I actually think people have become fleshly on all this grace stuff. Grace stuff, Brother Sheldon, I don't like how you said that. Well, let me tell you something. If all you do is fill people with your identity is in Jesus, your, your position is in Jesus, all, you're in Jesus, you're in Jesus. I have never received a position in my life that did not have with it a responsibility. And we have so much on, oh, we gotta get our position in Christ. Okay, I got my position in Christ. I need to start living my position in Christ. 
I know what I am in Christ. I know I'm saved in Christ. Now what's my responsibility? And that is to trust in my Lord. I don't, I'm not a debtor. I don't owe you anything this week, flesh. And when the flesh comes a calling, I don't know. I don't need to look at that. I don't need to say that. I don't need to go there. I don't need to do that because I don't owe the flesh a thing. Look at the next verse. For if ye live after the flesh, believer, you shall die. You're going to live separated. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's the way we're supposed to live. I just, I just want to share this with you. I've been preaching a lot in the last five, six weeks, and I've preached to hundreds of people. There's been some natural mans, and some of them gotten saved. And you may be here today, and you need to get saved. And I preach to some spiritual young people and some spiritual adults that are on fire for God. But I'm just telling you, the majority of the church in America today is carnal. You're all about self, and we need to judge that today and say, you know what, Lord? I'm a child of God, but I am not living the victorious Christian life. And I am so, I'm so, I get offended so easy. I'm so emotional. I've still got this bitterness. I got this unforgiveness. I am living strife and envy and divisions, and I gossip and I complain and I murmur. I need to stop living in the flesh. And I need to start living what I am in Jesus Christ. I know what I am in Christ. I'm victorious in Christ. Now I need to start practicing the position that God has given me. And that's our responsibility. Let me encourage you today. Don't live the carnal life. You're on your way to heaven and you have the spirit of God dwelling in you. Let's put flesh down and say, you know what? I don't need to say that to that person. That's a fleshly statement. I don't need to look at that. That's a worldly thing. I don't need to do that, and I don't need to go there. I don't owe the flesh a thing. My Savior, I want to live for, and I love my God, and I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit that dwells in me who's going to give me discernment. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask this. Is there somebody today, and I think you can make that you can make that decision. You know, Brother Scheller, I think I'm that natural man. I mean, you talked about things today that I just kind of like, whoa. I just I always thought you had to live a good life to get to heaven. I always thought it was what you did. But wow, it's not our works, is it? That's why Jesus had to die. That's right, that's right. That's the Spirit of God working in you right now. Listen, if you don't know for sure that you're on your way to heaven, you came to the right place today. You do not have to leave here a natural man on your way to hell. You can leave here today a spiritual man. You can ask Christ to save you from your sin. And I want to tell you, if, the whole, if there's something going on inside of you, that is the Spirit of God. You ought to be, first of all, so thankful. I did not feel comfortable today in this service. You ought to thank God for that right now. You ought to thank, because you know why? That means God's still working on you. That means you can get saved. Let me encourage you. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you like to do that right now? Would you? I, I, I won't embarrass you. I won't. But I, I'd love to know, you know what, Brother Shetler? I, I've never heard this term before, natural man. But I think that's me. I, 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 I don't believe I have a relationship with God, and I absolutely do not know where I'll spend in eternity, but I would like to know. Brother Shetler, would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? Is there anyone like that? Would you lift your hand up so I can pray for you? Would you admit, you know what? I think I've been a natural man. I want to become a spiritual man. I want to get saved. Is there anyone like that at all this morning? Thank you. I see that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Praise God for that.